Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Just do a little bit of shuffling here. Let's see. <laughs> I normally have this stuff up here, but I didn't get there for some reason this morning. Our text this morning is Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. If you want to go ahead and turn there. Mark chapter 9, beginning in verse 1. And as usual, we'll go ahead and begin by reading the text, and then we'll break it down from there. So follow along with me. It says in verse 1, And Jesus was saying to them, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and brought them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his garments became radiant and exceedingly white, as no launderer on earth can whiten them. Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to answer, for they became terrified. Then a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. All at once they looked around and saw no one with them except Jesus alone. As they were coming down from the mountain... He gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. They seized upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead meant. They asked him, saying, Why is it that the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And he said to them, Elijah, Elijah does first come and restore all things, and yet how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be betrayed with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come, and they did to him whatever they wished, just as it is written of them. So last week, we noted that the narrative shifted. Jesus was heading towards Jerusalem to face his cross, and along the way, he was revealing more about himself to his disciples to prepare them for his departure. And in our text last week, Jesus revealed both his messianic identity and his cross much more clearly. And in this morning's text, the theme of revelation continues on uninterrupted. Only this time, it continues on with only Peter, James, and John and not the other disciples. And so we see revelation happening in three phases here. First, Jesus revealed his messianic identity again in a huge way through the transfiguration in verses 2 through 8. And the transfiguration was spectacular. It's spectacular when we look at it. Um, it's profound and uh, it's interesting in many ways. But believe it or not, it's a, not a complicated concept in the narrative. Um, beneath all of that amazing uh, description, the transfiguration was basically a glimpse of Jesus in his full glorified state. And as far as this study is concerned, that's really all that we need to know about what's happening there. The purpose of the transfiguration, as spectacular as it was, was to demonstrate that Jesus was still Messiah, even with the cross. He's revealing more of himself and who he is to his disciples. He told them he's going to the cross. They're like, how can this even be the Messiah? And then they see him in this glorified way. So this is all driving home who he is. Next, on the way back down the mountain, Jesus restated his upcoming resurrection from the dead in verses nine and 10. And finally, he elaborated on John the Baptist's ministry as his forerunner. Um, though Mark's gospel doesn't plainly state John the Baptist. So in our text, in Jesus' revelation to his disciples continues. However, what stands out in this text is the disciples' woeful inability to comprehend what they were seeing and what they were hearing every step along the way. In fact, it's quite painful to watch how badly they just can't seem to comprehend what Jesus is showing them. For example, they didn't comprehend the transfiguration. We can see that. As Jesus was transfigured before them, he was speaking with Moses and Elijah. Look at what Peter says in verse five. I'm quoting from verse five now. It says, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And Mark tells us that Peter said this because he didn't know 
what to answer, how to say it, because they were all terrified. And so Peter, as tends to be his personality, if you don't know what to say, just blurt something out. You know, that's not a good rule of thumb, that's what he did here. Now we're not really sure what Peter meant by this. Uh, there are two main suggestions. The first is that Peter may have been seeking to erect tabernacles to venerate the three in some way. And the other is that he may have been attempting to facilitate them staying longer up on the mountain in that incredible situation. Either way, his words reveal that Peter had completely missed the point. He had no idea what was going on and what was happening up there. If Peter was seeking to venerate the three together, then it shows that he didn't really comprehend Jesus' identity very well. Jesus may have been speaking with Moses and Elijah, but that didn't make him equal with Moses and Elijah. The Messiah is not equal with Moses and Elijah, and so if that's what he was looking to do to venerate all three together, he just didn't get Jesus yet. And if Peter was seeking to keep them there longer, which I think is probably more of what's going on here, then it reveals his failure to comprehend Jesus' mission, and he was again trying to keep him from going to the cross, like last chapter, just in a different way. Regardless of the reason Peter said this, his words prove that he didn't grasp what he was witnessing on the Mount of Transfiguration, and we can be reasonably sure that James and John weren't doing a whole lot better, and Peter seems to accurately reflect what the disciples are feeling and thinking most of the time. So uh, they didn't comprehend his transfiguration, also they didn't comprehend his resurrection. As they were descending back down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders, I quote in verse nine, he gave them orders not to relate to anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man rose from the dead. And the text tells us that Peter, James, and John seized upon that statement, discussing with one another what rising from the dead meant in verse 10. So basically he says, don't tell anybody till I rise from the dead. They're looking back and forth and saying, rising from the dead? What, what does that mean? Rise from the dead? What does that mean? They don't even understand. Uh, they simply couldn't comprehend it. Even though he had already spoken of it before, he spoke it plainly. He wasn't speaking in parables or riddles here. He was saying, I'm going to rise from the grave. They were looking back and forth saying, I have no clue what you're talking about. Also, they didn't comprehend Jesus' forerunner. After Jesus' command to keep quiet, Peter, James, and John asked, why is it that all the scribes say that Elijah must come first in verse 11? Now, if I was to put this question another way, they might have been asking, if you're the Messiah, then why wasn't there a forerunner? The scribes have always taught that there was a forerunner. forerunner excuse me. Why haven't we seen a forerunner? That's basically what they're asking there. And when you think about it, you're seeing again that they've completely missed the point. Uh, they were with the forerunner the entire time and they completely missed him. And so Jesus answered by clarifying that the scribes were correct in their prediction of a forerunner and that the forerunner had already come. He was of course speaking of John the Baptist, although unlike Matthew's gospel, John the Baptist wasn't named here as the forerunner. So Peter, James, and John are simply not comprehending what they're hearing and seeing in this passage. And if we look ahead to the remainder of their journey to Jerusalem, which ends at the beginning of chapter 11, we can see that this problem continues. Jesus plainly states his upcoming death to his disciples two more times. Last week, we saw that he stated it. He's going to state it two more times, very plainly, on his way to Jerusalem. The first is later in this chapter. It's in verses 30 through 32. I'm going to put them up on the board for you. I quote, from there, they went out and began to go through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know about it. For he was teaching his disciples and telling them, the Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. In verse 32, it says, but they did not understand the statement, and they were afraid to ask him. Completely didn't understand it. The second warning is in chapter 10. Again, kind of more towards the end of the chapter. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking on ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed him were fearful. And again, he took the 12 aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn, to condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him, and three days later he will rise again. Two times, again, plainly stated, on the way to Jerusalem, this is what's gonna happen to me when I get there. These warnings, again, were as clear 
as the one that we looked at last week, but regardless, the disciples just didn't seem to comprehend it. We know this because when his crucifixion actually came, they were all completely blindsided by it. They forsook him, they fled, they were terrified, they didn't see it coming. It was as though they'd never heard it in the first place. So it's pretty plain to see that the disciples had a real problem comprehending what Jesus was showing them. And the big question we're gonna unpack this morning is why? How is it possible for ideas to be so plainly stated and yet not understood? What was the barrier in their minds that was preventing them from receiving the truth that Jesus was trying to show them? The answer, I'm just gonna state the answer up front and we'll kind of spend the rest of our time unpacking it. The answer is that they had pre-understandings. That is to say, they had beliefs already established in their minds about what Jesus was trying to show them. Does that make sense? In here, they already had beliefs established about what Jesus was trying to teach them. And they learned these false ideas in the fallen world. They were, these false ideas, excuse me, were deeply rooted in their minds through constant cultural reinforcement. And because these pre-understandings already existed in their minds, there was no space for God's truth to enter. It just bounced off. They couldn't comprehend it. Even when Jesus plainly stated things like, I'm going to rise from the dead, the disciples tended to look at each other cluelessly and go, what in the world is he even talking about? There was simply no space in their minds for the truth to enter because that space was already occupied by something false. Does that make sense? There was already something false in here that was preventing the truth from penetrating. Now, this exact same problem happens all the time today. They had it happening then, it happens to us now in lots of ways. I'm gonna give you some extreme examples, but these are just to help us illustrate what's happening here. An extreme, one extreme example might be the disease that we've called anorexia today. Uh, people with this disease have the false idea deeply entrenched in their minds that they're overweight. And so they literally starve themselves to death trying to address this problem, and they can't seem to see the reality no, how, no matter how much you put the reality of what's really going on right in front of their, right in front of their eyes. Um, someone with anorexia can literally stand in front of a mirror, emaciated from starvation, and in the reflection, they see someone who needs to lose weight. It happens to people. And the question is, is how is it possible? The answer is that they have a false idea in their mind that's preventing the truth from penetrating. It's as simple as that. It's very hard to deal with, but that's what's going on. Another extreme example would be the flat earth theory. Of course, I've mentioned this many times before, and I'll mention it again. But every time I mention it, I tell you this, and it continues to be the case, that the amount of people in the world who believe that the earth is flat continues to grow. To date, there are more and more people that are adopting the belief that the earth is flat. And this is in spite of the fact that we are saturated, literally saturated with images of the globe from orbiting satellites. And we actually even have a live feed of our globe from the International Space Station, also in orbit, which has also served the, to, as the home to hundreds of scientists who have witnessed the globe with their own eyes. Yet despite all this irrefutable evidence, more and more people are buying into the idea that the earth is flat. How is this possible? Again, there is a pre-understanding already in their minds. And in this case, it's something along the line of the system is lying to us and we can't trust anything that we're shown, something along that line. But this pre-understanding causes otherwise obvious facts to just bounce off their mind. They don't penetrate, they can't make their way in. So pre-understandings are barriers to God's truth. Pre-understandings that are already existing in our minds are barriers to God's truth. They block otherwise obvious kingdom realities from sinking into our minds. Now, in the disciples' case, in our text, the pre-understanding was regarding the nature of the Messiah. They viewed the coming Messiah in a strictly nationalistic sense. They were expecting the Messiah to overthrow Roman influence and establish Israel as a world power. And again, these ideas were deeply entrenched in their minds. They had been taught to them their whole life. They had been culturally reinforced in everything that they'd ever done. So these already present ideas caused God's truth to just bounce off. 
it couldn't penetrate their minds, no matter how clearly and plainly Jesus stated what was going to happen. They simply couldn't comprehend his cross and his death and his resurrection because they were completely incompatible with the ideas that were already rooted in their minds. And when you think about it, you can totally understand why that, this would be happening. It isn't their fault they were taught these things. They were conditioned their whole lives to believe a certain way, and Jesus was teaching them something that was completely incompatible with that, but it was already in here, and it was blocking what Jesus was trying to teach. Each. It's understandable. It happened to them. It happens to us today. So as it turns out, our minds work an awful lot like our closets. Our closets get easily filled with a bunch of junk. And once they're full, we don't have room to store the really important stuff that we need. But it's really hard to get rid of the old junk that's in there once it's already packed away. It's really hard to do it. Now, Granted, some people have more trouble than others. There's a debate between me and Holly. Holly and I could be up here and tell you about it. I'm more apt to throw junk away. Holly's more apt to, to, to see everything as a treasure, to keep and to store and to add more shelves. And I suppose within your own lives and your own situations, you have different feelings about it, but it's hard to get rid of the old stuff. And in the same way, we can't receive God's kingdom truth without first throwing away the old junk. And the old junk in this case, it's the false ideas that oppose God's truth, which we have learned and are present in our minds. To put it another way, you can't receive the truth without first throwing away the lies. This is why Paul said in Romans 12:2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, mind renewal, what is that exactly? Mind renewal implies much more than simply learning new ideas. Oftentimes I hear this text quoted in terms of learning new ideas, and it does involve that, but it implies more than that. It implies the, the renewal of your mind, the cleansing of your mind. That is to say, the replacing of old false ideas, the removal of those things, and the replacement of those things with good, godly kingdom, life-giving truth. Now, in order to receive God's kingdom truth, the old falsehoods that have been entrenched in our brains for our whole lives have to go. And it's not easy. In fact, deconstructing false ideas that are entrenched in our brains is among the hardest thing that we will ever do. But it must be done. So, for the remainder of our time together, I'm going to give three things that we must be willing to do in order to remove these entrenched false ideas, that is to say these barriers from truth in our minds. Three things, there's probably more, these are the only three I can think of, okay? The first is that we must be willing to acknowledge our ignorance. We must be willing to acknowledge our ignorance. One problem that keeps us clinging to false ideas is an overconfidence in our own knowledge. Now I'm not saying that we should live in a state of perpetual doubt and uncertainty, and I don't believe that the Bible teaches that we should do that either, but it is extremely spiritually healthy to be aware of the fact that our knowledge is limited, that there are things that we don't know, that we don't know as much as we think. It is this awareness that prompts us to grapple with ideas that we don't understand, rather than rejecting them outright as complete nonsense. Albert Einstein once said this, and I quote, the more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. The more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. Einstein's awareness of his ignorance is a big part of what enabled him to learn all the things that he did. Awareness of ignorance is what drives us to search for truth. However, if you think you've got it all figured out already, then you're not going to learn new things. And you're gonna shut out ideas that conflict with what's already going on in your mind. Now, by way of good measure, the Bible says the exact same thing. I'm quoting from Isaiah right now, Isaiah 55. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways, nor are your ways, excuse me, my ways, declares the Lord. For as high as the, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So step one to apprehending God's truth is realizing that there is so much that we just don't know. Without this, the truth just bounces off. And with this in mind, there is a basic sign I'm just going to give you one. I, I know I could really spend a lot of time on this, but I'm not going to. But there is a basic sign that we may be a bit too overconfident in our knowledge and that we may not be receiving kingdom truth 
uh, the, the kingdom truth that God is trying to reveal to us. And so I'm gonna ask yourself to self-evaluate right now and see how much this statement that I'm about to put on the board applies to you, okay? Don't say it out loud, just process how much this statement applies to you. My primary indicator of truth is that it makes sense to me. And my primary indicator of nonsense is that it doesn't make sense to me. Does that make, does that make sense? It's, I'm saying it too much, but think about it for a minute. My primary indicator of truth, what causes me to say this is truth is that I understand it, it makes sense. What causes me to say that that's lies, it's nonsense, is that I don't get it. People who are aware of their ignorance, they tend to regard what they don't understand as an invitation to learn more. But people who write off what they don't understand as nonsense do so, quite frankly, because they view themselves as the authority on truth. When you really think about it, it's a sign of real arrogance to say, that's stupid because I don't get it. But people do it all the time, and that mindset keeps them in the dark spiritually. As the disciples followed Jesus, they were constantly confronted with ideas that didn't make sense and ideas that clashed with everything that they'd ever been taught. When, in the long run, they received the truth, it was because they kept grappling with what Jesus said. And they did this instead of rejecting it outright. So Jesus was constantly confronting them but they didn't completely reject it. They struggled with it, they, but they, to their credit, they grappled with it. And in the same way, we must do the same. We must grapple and lean into the things that we don't understand. So there's the willingness um, to acknowledge our ignorance. There's also the willingness to lose our investments, okay? Another force keeping us attached to false ideas is our life investment in them, okay? We invest our lives in what we believe. And with this in mind, we can't jettison a false idea without losing everything that we've invested in it. And let me just give you an example. Um, I don't mean to pick on the Jehovah's Witnesses, but they have a good example to, to give here. Um, if you, have you ever talked to Jehovah's Witnesses? One of the things that they believe, uh, that they believe historically, is that blood transfusions is the equivalent of eating blood, which is forbidden in the Old Testament. And so your average Jehovah's Witnesses to your average Jehovah's Witness to this day will refuse blood transfusions on the basis that they believe it's eating blood, which is forbidden in the Old Testament. And there is, even within their own ranks, more and more of them don't agree with it anymore. But they continue to hold doggedly to that position year after year. Why? Because a lot of people have suffered and a lot of people have died adhering to that belief and to say this is false and to jettison it. They can't do that without absorbing the sacrifice that they've made and that everyone else has made. Does that make sense? Whenever you take an idea and reject it as false, there's going to be a price to pay. There's going to be loss because there is life investment that goes in to the false idea. You can't leave false doctrine, you can't leave false ideas without losing everything that you've sacrificed into it. You're gonna lose the things that you've abstained from, you're gonna, you, you, the, the holidays that you refuse to celebrate, the, the meats that you refuse to eat, whatever, all that stuff is gonna go when you abandon the false idea. You're gonna be able to receive truth and it's gonna be much better, but it's gonna cost you. And I've talked about this before, and so what comes to my mind is an illustration about my white truck. If you've heard this illustration before, I apologize, but I have a white Ford F-250 out there, um, and before that I had a blue one, and I bought it used, and uh, I, it was kind of a fixer-upper, and so I kept maintaining it. And I had it for a couple of years, but over time, it began to nickel and dime me more and more. But it was paid for and I didn't want to buy a new truck. I didn't feel like, it didn't feel like I could afford it. And so I kept, every time it nickeled and dimed me, I kept putting money in it and I kept telling myself, it's gonna get through the worst of it soon and then it'll be good for a while. And this would come up and that would come up and I'd put $1,000 into it here, 700 there. And finally it came up to inspection time one year and I had to put about 2,500 bucks into it to get inspected. And I was like, you know what? It's still better to, it's better to keep running this truck than to buy, buy a new one. Um, so I'm going to just keep, keep digging into this thing. And so I dropped the money, I paid it, I got it inspected, and I started, and I drove it home from uh, that work. And as I, was, I was driving, as I picked it up and as I was driving it home, I started hearing this rattle. 
And I was like, what's that rattle? I can't understand. And um, I got to looking in a side view mirror, and I could see that the whole bed of the truck was rattling because it had rotted off the frame. And I realized that the whole truck was falling apart under me. And I, I wanted to tell myself at that moment, you know, it's okay, just a few more bucks and I'm gonna have it taken care of, you know, just keep pumping money in. It's, it'll be better to keep running this truck than to buy a new one. But finally I said, uncle, at that point. And I said, nope, it's time to trade it up. But the reason I share this example is, is that I had been listening to a false idea the whole time saying, it's better to run this truck than buy a new one while I was wrong. And the only way for me to abandon that idea was to also take the loss of all those thousands of dollars that I had recently put into trying to keep it going. I had just dropped 2,500 bucks, and the only way for me to abandon that false idea was to eat that. Does that make sense? That's the way false ideas work. It hurts to abandon them because, and part of the reason we cling to them is because we'll have to eat it. There's a price to be paid, and that can keep people to clinging to them. Uh, you have to know when to fold them sometimes, and uh, that, is part of abandoning false ideas. The last is that we need to be willing to tr retrain our minds, retrain our minds. Um, another, another force, the last one we're gonna talk about that keeps us attracted to false ideas is quite simply habit, plain and simple. If we've been living a certain way our whole lives based upon a false idea, then we're at times going to gravitate towards it by force of habit alone, even after we jettison the idea or even after we're thinking differently about it. Again, differences between me and Holly, but, and I think this is something I've shared before, um, but there are false ideas that were ingrained in my mind from childhood that I'm still on learning. And one of them, for whatever reason is, is that uh, everyone else around me is, is more important. I, I don't know why I got this idea in my mind, but I have this weird, anxiousness whenever I get into a busy checkout line. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been in that state where you're in the checkout line and there's people behind you and you don't want to hold up all the people behind you because, you know, it's, it's rude, you know. Admittedly, when I'm in the checkout line and I'm behind someone who's holding it up, I'm like, hurry up, you know. I, I hide that I'm a pastor and stuff, but I'm like, hurry it up. But I hate holding up the line. I, I, I feel terrible about it. And I know that um, deep down inside there's this belief that you know, they're more important than I am. Holly doesn't have this idea. Holly is totally fine with being there. She's like, I have every right to be here as much as they do. You know, she's not looking to drag it out, but I'm gonna stay here, do my business, and then they'll be able to get here um, when I'm done. They have to wait in line just like we did. But for me, I'm always anxious, I'm always hurrying. Um, and I know that that idea in my mind isn't true. Um, and I can tell myself stuff that over and over again, but for some reason, every time I get into a line, I get anxious and frustrated and I wanna hurry things up. And the reason I share this with you is to say that even after you abandon the ideas, you have to retrain your thinking over and over and over again. And some of these old ideas have been there so long that by force of habit, you're still going to behave those ways and you're gonna to have to retrain yourself over and over and over again. And it can take months and it can take years and in some cases it can even take decades, like me and my checkout line issue. But whatever the case may be, um, we need to jettison old ideas to be able to receive God's truth. And there are lots of things that are going on in here that keep us from being able to do that. And understanding that false ideas are what prevent the truth from coming through, it helps me to conceptualize our mission today. Because we think of our mission as spreading the gospel and making disciples, and I'm not wanting to split hairs over this, but our, our goal is to enhance people's lives by spreading the gospel and sharing it with them. And we tend to think of that in terms of dispersing information, sharing the gospel with other people so they can hear the truth. But our nation and much of the globe has been saturated with the gospel, yet people don't believe. And what I mean by this, and the reason I share this, is to say that I wonder if in today's day and age, our mission is just, a much about, just as much about helping people deconstruct false ideas that are already in their mind as it is telling them the truth. That is to say, they're hearing the truth, just like people who believe in a flat earth are seeing the globe. It's, it's not that they're not hearing the truth or seeing the truth, it's that there's something in here that's preventing that truth from penetrating. And I would imagine that our goal today as Christians is just as much about helping people deconstruct false ideas so that the truth can get in as it is speaking the truth. 
And I will warn you in advance that helping people to deconstruct false ideas that are in their head, they never like it, they never appreciate it. Um, I have never liked it and I've never appreciated it. It's always been hard for me. But it is absolutely essential to spiritual growth and knowing Jesus. And so my prayer would be for all of us that we would be able to recognize some of these false ideas that are getting in the way of us receiving what God has for us. And God would help us to jettison them, to get rid of them. And with that said, will you pray with me? Father, um, we thank you that you are faithful to communicate the truth to us. And we thank you that you are patient about it. And that as, as, as long as it took the disciples to get it, as many times as it flew over their heads, every time you told them what was going to happen, you kept telling them and you kept working with them till they got it. And I know that uh, I can say for certain that the reason that I'm here is because of the patience you've had with me. And I know that these people here can say the same thing. And so I pray that you'd give us the patience that you have to deal with other people and that you'd continue to be patient with us as we learn more and more about your kingdom. Help us to unlearn the things that are false so that we can receive more and more of your truth. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.